right, ladies and gentlemen. I think we still have a couple of open seats at the bottom there for those looking for seats. But uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, good morning, well, rather, good afternoon. I'm Daniel Iola, Program Coordinator at the Berkman Client Center. Um, just wanted to relay a couple of announcements to you about our, some of our upcoming events. On Thursday, we have litigating free speech cases in the African Regional Courts featuring Berkman Klein Fellow Nanny Jensen Raventla. So that will be in Hauser. And the, our next lunch and talk will not be next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, November 15th. And that's the end of ownership with Professor um, Aaron Przenowski of Case Western uh, Reserve Law School. So without further ado, I, before I introduce our introducer of our speaker, <laughs> I just want to remind you all that this production is live webcast for posterity. It will be available uh, on YouTube within the next couple of days, so uh, be mindful of what you say. And yeah, that's, or not, that, that's uh, an option as well. So now I'll introduce that. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to be really brief and then hand it off to Paola just by saying that I run the clinical program here at the Berkman Klein Center. We work a lot with the ACLU of Massachusetts, and Paola first came, her work first came to my attention through that connection to ACLU. The Data for Justice project that she's going to be talking about today is an outgrowth of the work that she's been doing at the ACLUM, the ACLU of Massachusetts, over the last year as a Ford Mozilla Open Web Fellow. Um, and I've seen her write about her development of a data visualization framework. I think we're going to hear a lot about that and about more broadly about the themes of data science in the public interest. And without further ado, I'll just hand it off to cool. Capella. Thanks. <laughs> and to be clear, we'll, we'll save plenty of time for questions at the end. We have a couple microphones so we can make sure everything is captured. Um, so just at the end, we'll, we'll hand those around and uh, do some Q&A. Thanks, Capella. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah cool. So thanks all for coming. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be here talking to you, uh, especially in this, in this topic that is very interesting, in my opinion. Let me just put my password. OK. Mm. Um, presentation. OK. So the topic today is public interest in the, uh, data science. And I want to start by saying that, uh, well, with this quote, which is, able lawyers have to, to a large extent allowed themselves to become agents of great corporations and have neglected their obligation to use their powers for the protection of the people. Um, this quote started the public interest law. And I think if we change lawyers and we use technologies, the same applies. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, but first, I want to define what is public interest. And I think it's very simple. It's to affect change in public policies uh, in the interest of the Commonwealth um, and to advocate for the underrepresented and build this or, or cheer for the underdog, so to speak. And then, what is data science? Data science is um, to extract knowledge um, and insight from information and data. And then it's the intersection of math, statistics, research, information science, and computer science. And if we take that into consideration, it might be very simple to explain uh, what, are, what, what the public interest data science is. So. What happens, uh, like the, the motivation of why I, I applied for these fellowships and why I'm working on what I'm working on is because I was wondering what uh, will happen if you put data and technology in the hands of uh, civil liberties organizations, human rights activists, uh, media outlets, and governments. So my background is a little bit uh, in the government, in the open data movement, and the open source software movement. So I, li I have lived, um, like my experience is, uh, I, just in a few words, is that I wouldn't be here if it were not for open source and the internet and the open web. So I think that data and technology, as it changed my life, it can also change society. And I think we are going to uh, see that more in the future. Um, so now that we recognize that there are civil liberties organizations and human rights activists that need data and technology, um, 
but why? What what can you can we change? Uh, oh, sorry. Let do you want me to move here? Yeah. Okay. Let's. I need to control this. Okay. Yeah. This is better, right? Yeah. I'm fine. But I have a mic here. Hey. Hello. 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 Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so, what do we, what do they need data for? And I think it's oh, it's okay. Uh, we can affect change in liberty and justice and equality, and especially transparency and accountability. And I think these are the main things that we can um, affect change in. And I think that's the key for uh, like a new society. So, but but who else can data help? And I think lawyers, journalists, policymakers, and advocates and activists can benefit from data and technology. But um, maybe this is like a very uh, hard, uh, like they, they need the skills. Uh, they need to gather the skills for them to have an effect on their causes. And that's basically why I think this is very important. So. The, I think also that intersections of data and liberty, for instance, or data and justice and data and, and equality can have a uh, very important impact in, in privacy or surveillance or, or ending the war on drugs or the mass incarceration uh, phenomenon. And then we can also, through data and technology, uh, end uh, or at least shed light in biases and improve uh, access to justice for uh, a lot of people, especially the, under, the underrepresented people. So I'm going to present the Data for Justice project, which is a collaboration. Well, it's enabled by the Ford Foundation, the ACLU of Massachusetts, and Mozilla Foundation. Um, it started as, my, as the project of my fellowship, like the Open Web Fellowship uh, that I was in 2015. And it became now, um, like my fellowship got extended at the ACLU. And now as, far as a, a Bergman Center fellow, um, I'm trying to uh, absorb uh, Bergman's knowledge into this project. So the Data for Justice project aims to empower, empower uh, lawyers and advocates um, to make fact-based and data-driven uh, decisions and uh, do their work like uh, advocacy um, to improve access to justice in their communities by providing them and decision makers with answers to questions such as how isolation, biased policing, uh, race, and poverty relate to each other. Uh, what we're seeing here, uh, and I'm going to talk about that um, more in depth in the, in the following minutes, is this is Boston, Massachusetts, and what you're seeing is the green color is people of color. Uh, obviously, the greener the color, uh, the more percentage of, the higher the percentage of uh, people of color live in that area. And the red dots are um, uh, drug arrests. So this is like only a, a simple sa example of how data and data visualization in this case can show that basically uh, the war on drugs is racially charged. So I'm going to talk about the process um, and how we try to implement this process at the ACLU. And I think the first thing, and it's uh, the most important, is how do you, how do you get the data? Um, we have here Anne Lambert, <laughs> which is uh, uh, one of the lawyers at the ACLU, and she is very uh, like this is her topic. Like, how do you get data? And um, I think uh, Freedom of Inter Information Acts uh, are the key. But in many cases, especially coming from the ACLU, they get denied. Like, so in one of these cases that I'm going to talk about, um, we asked for police records, and we, we we waited for a year and a half, and they won't give it to us. So we sued. And also, it's very important to. Uh, don't give up on getting the data because you want to change uh, this uh, problem. So we stood and we won. Um, and then 
uh, after that, I normalize the data, and that's all, that's my work. Like the, the the things involved are my work. I normalize it and process it and I and analyze it and visualize it. Um, but that's not it. It doesn't end there. I think we also have oh, we have Kate here, which is an advocate at the ACLU, and her, their work is um, to socialize it and inform change. And then we also have other departments that are uh, that, need, that their work is to make it last. So if you see it as a flow chart, it's okay. You identify a cause, uh, and if you have data, well, yay, data. Uh, if you don't have data, which is very common, uh, do you know who who has data? If you don't know, well, you need to research, and. If you do know who has it, and it's, is, it, is it open data? Um, if it's not, well, you need to go through the legal channels, which are, which are the ones I mentioned, mentioned, FOIAs and lawsuits. And then you get the data, and after you get the data, uh, this is my work, this is data science. Uh, you, do, you develop, um, measurements and indicators and you research and measure and you ask your question is this good is this good is this good is this? until it's not and when it's not you can design a solution or a, or a methodology to solve or improve this problem with community engagement and this is where Kate's work uh, <laughs> starts and yeah, and, it, and I think it's very important also from the beginning to involve communities in the solution. So it's more like a um, co-designed uh, solution because it's very easy for us uh, that have the data and the skills to say, oh, I'm able to solve the problem by myself and I'm uh, going to reach out to communities with the solution. And uh, I think that's not how it should work, especially when you are talking about people. Um, affected communities should be involved from the beginning of the, and that's what the ACLU basically does. But then, uh, if you want to change these things, you need to uh, also involve all the actors and stakeholders. So you also need to co-design with them, and you need to uh, create, uh, run workshops and do uh, this co-designing for the solution. Uh, I think it's very important that the government, for instance, is so, it's also involved, which is the hard part because in, in many ways you are saying to the government or to the public officials that their work is not done as good as it could be, right? And especially in the case of the criminal justice um, system. So um, you have the, your workshops and do you have a solution? Do you have an idea that can be implemented? Do you have like practical uh, or empirical um, solution that can be implemented? And if you do, well, yeah, you, you can relax a little bit and then make it last, make it uh, through legislative means or to other means to make it permanent. I think it's also very important to think about that, but it's like a separate pro process and it takes longer and longer and longer. So, uh, this is how it looks like all the, this is the, the, I call it the data process. And it's like an abbreviation and this is how I, I look the process of the data for justice project. Um, so I'm gonna speak about the projects, uh, like the particular projects we, we've been working on uh, here. So we have three projects right now which can be accessed. The first one, uh, is the Dukan case. How many of you are familiar with Dukan? Okay, oh, cool. So I'm, I'm gonna go inside in deep on that. But we also have a stop and frisk data sets and the marijuana regula uh, regulation uh, that is coming in the ballot in November 8. Um, so as you can see, it's basically work between the legal department and the advocacy department. Um, and data is in the, the intersection of, the, of both. So the Dukan case, um, Andy Dukan was a chemist that uh, worked in a, in a crime lab in Massachusetts. And she was um, in charge of performing the drug tests for contraband uh, or seizures. 
she falsified um, evidence, and thanks to data, and thanks to the work at the ACLU, we have come to the number of more than 24,000 cases. So these are 24,000 people that didn't have access to justice, that, uh, the, that w their rights were violated because the, um, the um, I, I forgot the, the word. Um, okay, um, so yeah, the, their rights were violated because of this uh, action of the chemist. She was working at least for six years, uh, like co six complete years, and then um, two more years that were half and half. So th the impact is that a lot of people were inca incarcerated because of her. Um, and some, some say that, there, that, that there's no more people incarcerated because of her. But still, the impact is that some people were deported, others have bad records that can also affect in other jurisdictions. So for instance, there's a case in Florida where a man is facing uh, life in prison because um, he committed a crime or in, in Florida and the prosecutors um, find out one of these cases and that, will, and that is the, his uh, third strike. So that, that can happen. And also, um, one of the key, of, of the key uh, things to know about this case is that prosecutors say that these are bad, bad people, that they were like flooding the, the streets with drugs. And in fact, only 62%, uh, I mean, in fact, 62% of the cases are possession only. So it's uh, consumers instead of distributors uh, that are affected by this. Um, so th only 37% uh, are distribution. So we have uh, some interesting uh, tables. So this table uh, talks about, um, is the division of the 24,483 cases uh, divided by, co by county uh, and also divided by adult cases and juvenile, juvenile cases. Um, as you can see, uh, Essex and Suffolk are the top two uh, clients of this, this, uh, this lab. And then, uh, this is the, the distribution of uh, the type of cases. So 62% are possession and distribution, uh, no distribution, and 37% are other, are, are, are distribution, and 1% is other cases which are like uh, conspiracy and others that were not possess possession or distribution. And then um, we have this table that shows uh, the percentage of cases with adverse disposition um, from 2013 and the percentage, and uh, what percentage they represent in the total of the cases. So we have some counties that are, that almost 30% of their drug cases were affected by this. For instance, um, it's, uh, I think it's Nantucket, or what is this? Nor Norfolk. Norfolk uh, has 30% of their cases tainted, and Suffolk has 32% of its cases um, tainted. That's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, you can access these, these, these are screenshots from the affidavit site submitted uh, that we uh, that I worked with the lawyers at the ACLU, um, so I, I have the links uh, uh, that I can send it to you because they are like very interesting and it's this is only like a light res uh, resume of this case. So yeah, uh, I think that we can actually use data to change these twenty four thousand people's lives, and I think it's very powerful. Um, then another example of this work is, and then I, we can discuss and all that, uh, is the yes on four, which is the question four. Um, and if you say yes to, the, to if you answer yes uh, on the question four in the November 8th ballot, you are validating the um, marijuana legalization, well, regulation and taxation in Massachusetts. Um, and the argument we are using, and we are using data to prove it, is that marijuana-related police interactions um, are racially biased um, because they only happen mainly where people of color live. 
and you can see that it's uh, it's again the, the same the same pattern. Uh, green color is people of color, and the red dots are uh, where arrests happened since August 2015 to date. So yeah, there is a I think a very clear pattern, and I want to show you how this looks. So I'm gonna go. To, oh, sorry. I'm gonna come here. Okay. Oh, where is it? <laughs> okay. So this is an advocacy campaign that can be accessed by uh, this website, um, which is yay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So let me just play it right there. Marijuana policing destroys lives every week in Boston. Even though Massachusetts overwhelmingly passed marijuana decriminalization in 2008, right now an average of 13 people every week are arrested or harassed by the police because of marijuana. Just one arrest can permanently change one's life for the worse, causing barriers to employment, schooling, and housing. The data shows the majority of police interactions and arrests for marijuana offenses occur in neighborhoods where mostly people of color live. Let's explore the data from the 2014 census and the data produced daily by the Boston Police Department. 46% of Boston's population is white. 25% of Boston's population is black. And 29% of Boston's population are other people of color. As you can see, the city is racially segregated. White, people of color, white, people of color. Now, let's look at where police harass and arrest people because of marijuana. This is where marijuana incidents happened last week. And this is where marijuana incidents happened since August 2015. Do you notice a pattern? White, people of color, white, people of color. We can help end racially biased policing of marijuana. Vote yes on four. So I think that's, uh, um, this is the, one of the examples of what data um, technology can help uh, like to do these type of arguments. So let's see, how does this work? And I'm going to talk about my tools um, oh, I can't find the mouse. <laughs> okay, I think it's here. No, nope. Uh, here it is. Oh no! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> what is it? It won't come. Okay, here it is. Okay. Oh, did you get the URL? It can be accessed by your phone and all that. So. Um, share it. <laughs> so this is my work. These are my tools. I do a lot of data cleaning and normalization, and I think a lot of, about data structures. Um, I love, like, uh, I consider myself like a uh, systems architecture ar architect, and also a data architect more than a, a data scientist. I do a lot of structure thinking, and. I do a lot of processing. I use tons of uh, Python and PHP and SQL. Uh, I've been working on SQL for almost, I don't know, uh, 17 years. So I, I know it very well. And that enables me to uh, leverage these uh, skills to uh, actually make it very easy for us to, e to output this processed and um, processed data to other tools like Stata or R, which are uh, also the things I, I use. 
And then also I think uh, one of the main skills is uh, GIS, which is the, the things I use for, uh, and, I, and I think they're crucial for uh, translating all this data to where people live or where people is. So that's why I love PostKeys. I think it's very important uh, tool. And then to visualize it, to, to tell a story, I think um, it's also very important. And to do that, I developed this framework, which I'm not going to talk about that much. But I, I developed a data visualization framework that enables me to do that kind of pieces, uh, like the one of, of marijuana legalization, uh, in very little time and with a lot of information uh, being displayed and analyzed. So the, its name is uh, ANT, which, he, which stands for Augmented Narrative Toolkit. And it, it be, it's built on already developed tools like D3 and Score Magic and jQuery and all these other tools. Um, I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I just want to, implement, to make it easier for people to, um, to use these very complex tools like D3. So my aim by developing Ant is uh, for you to be able, <coughs> sorry, for you to be able to put a map or a chart in a web page as easily as you would an image, um, which is like a, a standard HTML uh, tag. So my theory behind that is that if you enable people uh, to use uh, HTML uh, to do data visualization, HTML and CSS, I think that we are going to start to see a data-driven um, internet. And I think that's, that can be very, very cool. But then what? Uh, the visualizations are cool. Um, but I think the most important uh, thing is the outreach. We want to have impact on people's lives. Uh, I mean, the technical challenge is there, and it's kind of cool to solve it. But I think uh, that if the work I, I've been doing doesn't have an impact on people's lives, I think I, I wouldn't be happy about it. Like, I will be only half happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think outreach to communities, outreach to the authorities or the lawmakers, it's very important too. And so, for instance, there's a case where um, one of these visualizations got the attention of the Urbano project, which is um, a youth of color uh, work group in Jamaica Plain. And what they asked their, their fellows is to create this, um, to, to do something with, it, with this data. And what the kids did, I think was like a, an amazing thing, was a, they painted the map that I just uh, showed you uh, in a mural in Jamaica Plain, and they marched with that mural um, through all these neighborhoods. And I think uh, it's very uh, low tech, but I think that's like the, that completes a cycle of data, uh, because that specific, those data points, th those specific data points went from um, the asking for the data in the FOIA, then suing for them, for, for it, then it got processed and we reached out to communities and the communities did something that then impact in, in other types of uh, stakeholders. And I think when, when I saw that, I cried. I was like, oh, this is, this is how things should be working. It's not about a technical challenge. So my conclusions are that data and tech do n don't do anything by themselves. People do. Uh, Data science is very cool, very, very cool, and it's a technical challenge. Um, but it's only a part of, of, of a team with a common goal. I wouldn't be standing, standing here if it were not for uh, my coworkers, uh, coworkers at the ACLU that are kick-ass. Um, and also, the intersections are very important. Uh, exploring law and data, it's, it's very cool. Exploring uh, data and uh, inequity is also very important. So, yeah, data and tech in the hands of the public interest organizations working to reduce inequality can have an impact on people's lives. Thank you. <laughs> so, 
if anyone has questions, yay. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. I have a question. I love this presentation. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, so there was a point at the beginning of your of your talk. Oh. Okay. Thanks. Hi. I was just saying that I love this project uh, and all the work that you're doing uh, with your colleagues. And my question is about uh, in the beginning of the presentation uh, in your flowchart. Um, you talked to there's sort of a parenthetical statement where you said you could also involve the community that's most affected earlier in the process, for mm -hmm. example, when uh, in data gathering or in identifying the data sets that are needed. And I know that Urbano project that you just referenced, they did a, a project like that where um, they were looking at transportation inequality in Boston. Mm -hmm. And they had young uh, youth of color from Boston keep journals of their transit times, like to school, to work, that type of thing. And they created visualizations of uh, transit inequality uh, by race and geography in Boston. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more um, about, yeah, what are, what, are the, what are the challenges that are keeping more data scientists or people who are doing the type of work that you are from engaging uh, communities that are most impacted at different points in the process? Why does that happen so infrequently? Because I, I think it's hard. Um, it's, it's expensive. And um, yeah, I don't know. If it were not for me being a, in a paid fellowship, I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, because raising the money to compete with Facebook for the ACLU is a challenge. And then um, reaching out is it's a full-time job. Like, it's, it's not very easily done. And you need to have, like, a street credibility and all that. Uh, you need to have connections to the communities. And I think uh, that only through the collaboration with, um, with uh, organizations you can do it, like community organizing for reals. Uh, I think that's, that's the main challenge. So data scientists are um, very, like, technically skilled. But they, it's, they're very far from, in, in, I'm generalizing, of course, but uh, from community organizing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, sure. Great, okay. great project, and the Thank visualizations you. are compelling, of course. Uh, I wanted to, so, so a lot of these data uh, are, are very personal and private. There is data about race and uh, criminal convictions and location. Uh, and I'm wondering what's done in terms of uh, privacy in the data sharing process. Do you get the raw data? Do you get like uh, to just uh, perform queries? And what's the privacy uh, um, cover for this? Well, um, so in the Dukan case, I had access to private information, like personal information. That, that includes um, names and social security numbers of people uh, like w that were charged in these cases. Um, this data is impounded, and it's like I use security measurements to keep it that way. And that's one case. The other maps are open data. And so they are, they've been through a process of the uh, anon anonymization. And so for instance, uh, if I showed you this. Uh, okay. So these are not where exactly happened. These are like a grid. So a grid that is, I think, uh, half a mile. Uh, so if an, an incident happened there, it goes, it goes to that point. That enables us to, to remove the identification layer. So people, or for instance, uh, um, so, so people don't can, can say where something in particular happened, so that they don't have the repercussions of being de-anonymized. So yeah. Um, Paula, oh, cool. I hey. my name is Kate Crockford. I work with Paula at the ACLU. I just wanted to actually to Paula's horn a little bit more than you did um, to tell you all the significance of having a data scientist on staff for the legal department in the midst of the Bridgman litigation. So the Bridgman litigation is the drug lab case. We got the disposition data through that litigation. As Paula said, some of it was impounded. We filed a motion asking the court to um, unseal the non-personally identifiable information aspects of that data, which they did. 
Um, and then Paolo was able to perform this really important analysis, which revealed things like the fact that 62% of these cases were possession only, which nobody knew before that. Um, so that was reported in the press as a major finding. We That was like a major part of our brief, one of our briefs in the case. And then you know, that one in three cases in Suffolk County was tainted by this scandal. I mean, these are these are really important pieces of our legal arguments in um, the Bridgman litigation that we would not have been able to make had we not had Paola on our staff. So I just want that to be very clear. And also, I would just like to tell you, I don't know if you know this, but the prosecutors filed a, a motion a couple, last week that pretty much disses Paola really hard <laughs> and says, yeah. which I think is great, because it means you're doing the right thing. People, are, <laughs> Powerful people hate you already, so fantastic. Um, they, said, <laughs> they said things, they effectively said, I mean, if you want it, the Bridgman litigation is really insane. I encourage you to read about it, because it'll put your head in a spin cycle. So one of the things they said about Paola is that it was not the intention of the court when they unsealed this information for anyone to actually look at it. <laughs> they really said that. The prosecutor said that in a brief to the court. Yes, the court unsealed this information, but the purpose of unsealing it wasn't so people could understand what was going on, okay? And we're really upset that this yeah. meddling Paola Villarreal person bothered to look at it. So. Just so you know, she's really making an impact. It's really valuable from the ACLU to have a scientist working on information like this. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Is there a is there a page on the web anywhere where you uh, link to all the tools that you use to do this, uh, so that other people can do the same thing and follow your methodology? Yeah, we have a GitHub page. I mean, all these. Except for the Dukan case, which is like a court case, an ongoing litigation, all other things are public in GitHub. Um, uh, yep. Um, so github.com uh, uh, data for justice. Yeah. So you 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 will be able to see the code for this which is in the, this is a GitHub page. So you will be able to see this. And the methodology that I need to update. And this is like, this describes the, the process to get the, from the census data to all the police data and all that. So, and there are other projects, so yes. We know what happened to the uh, person who falsified the data, but the, the question is, what happened to the people <laughs> who are in jail? Uh, some, some are. Um, maybe Anne can uh, answer that question in particular. I'm sorry to put you on the. It's OK. Um, I'll try. Um, we don't know. Answer, we don't know the I don't know the actual numbers. The response, of the response of the legal system was to recognize immediately that the people who were serving time at that moment when this was discovered had to be, have an opportunity to challenge their convictions and get out. And in um, pretty short order, the court system mobilized and had uh, special magistrates appointed, special hearings. All of this, by the way, to follow up on Cade's point, was challenged by the Commonwealth. Oh, you can't vest those retired judges with judicial powers to admit people to bail or even to have hearings where they make recommendations to a real superior court judge about releasing people on bail. But the, the litigation that's going on now, and, and who knows? I mean, I think probably the court system did an, a good um, a first cut job in figuring out who was still incarcerated and doing something about it. The problem uh, was, uh, as Paula has described, uh, that then a certain amount of inertia, lassitude set in. What about the 24,000 other people? What, what are the remedies going to be for them? Um, should we do something? Or, as the Commonwealth seems to say, you know, 
is just so formidable. You know, finding these people, what, you know, gee, it's so overwhelming. You know, we just can't handle that. So the point of the Bridgman litigation, bolstered by what Paola has been able to demonstrate, is, you know, we have to do something about it. The burden of these uh, tainted convictions shouldn't fall on the people who got them. It should fall on the people who went about prosecuting them and then imposing them. So that's the issue that's going to be argued in the court next week. Is, I mean, that's semi an answer. I mean, it divides the world of Dukin victims into people who were incarcerated, where the system sort of responded, but not fully, uh, and the uh, uh, people that the system uh, at least with, you know, Commonwealth versus John Smith, the Commonwealth was kind of willing to let those go, where the people in the Bridgman case uh, or our organization, the public defenders, have said, uh-uh, uh-uh, you've got to pay attention to them, too. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've been conducting, uh, hosting a discussion in the context of a Harvard X MOOC called Jury X, which began discussion just this week of the issue of yes on question four. And the most provocative. Hello. Yes. The most provocative question has been the, the way, a way how to think about the fact that the leadership of the Commonwealth in the person of the governor, the attorney general, and the mayor of Boston have been absolutely opposed to the yes on four. And the question posed that was provocative is, is there a relationship between the uniformity of the opposition of law enforcement emphasized in this morning's paper by the support of the prosecutors for the opposition, uh, police opposition to yes on four. Is there a relationship between cannabis reform and Black Lives Matter? And you've answered that question. Your, your work is such a beautiful demonstration of it. Thank you. That it is remarkable that Black Lives Matter as a movement hasn't cottoned on to cannabis reform as a sister issue. I mean, look, here we are. We're not a Black Lives Matter group. And yet we can see it absolutely clearly. It's a curiosity. It's a, but thank you very much for the work you've done. It's extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Hi, Paula. I've been reading um, Kathy O'Neill's new book, Weapons of Math Destruction, yes. <laughs> uh, which is a terrific look at how algorithms are impacting uh, vulnerable communities around the country. Oh, sorry. So it's a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. It's written by this woman, Kathy O'Neill, who was at D.E. Shaw and is an applied math person. Um, and I was thinking about that and about your Brandeis quote from the beginning, and I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the origins of your passion for social justice as a data scientist and what we can do in the data science community to get um, data scientists excited about this. Do we need some sort of formalized training the way we do pro bono for law students? Okay. So <laughs> to answer that question, I will have to tell you like my background, which is I'm Mexican. I'm 32 years old. And when I was 15, I started working, well, I learned to code when I was 12. And I only was able to do that because I, I had access to the internet. And I started talking to people that were coincidentally uh, also developing the chats we were using. So that, uh, I don't know, that piqued my curiosity. Um, so that's how I learned about Linux back in 1997. And then I learned the, about C, the, the language. 
So fast forward three years, I started working as a web developer in Mexico when I was 15. And then fast forward four years, I was the sysadmin for Mexico's president's office. And I was in charge of securing the web servers and enable, enabling uh, like a development platform for uh, the Mexico's president's office. Um, so I started reflecting on what had enabled me to do that because at that moment I recognized that I didn't have like peers my age uh, doing the work I was doing. So I, the answer was open source and openness. So I think that, and that's when I decided that um, through openness and open source, uh, I could actually enable people, more people to, to do the work I'm doing. And now fast forward 12 years and I'm doing that. I'm, I've been working at, in governments, I've been working with um, sexual and reproductive um, uh, organizations, uh, freedom of expression organizations, um, and all this type of work uh, are only trying to demonstrate that openness and open source can actually change people's lives. And now I think my, my goal is to inspire, inspire other people to do just that. So yeah, I think that's, that's it. <laughs> I thank you for the, um, the uh, ballot question on four. Now, uh, it does bring up a point of, you know, what in data analysis like this, um, there's the legal aspect that you dealt with. And, and certainly, um, you know, that is very apparent. Now, what is the, what's the social impact on this type of data analysis where um, cannabis reform is one part is the legal aspect of it. The other part is the effect on the community as a whole. What kind of data exists for gateway drugs um, in, in other communities where it has been decriminalized? Um, that's what the social impact would be. Is there any kind of work along those lines? Because the, the ballot question, and I'm, I'm speaking as a, as a a lone voter out here is flawed because it, it deals only with the criminalization, but it is not. It's, it's actually about the long-term social impact that can happen in this community. What has, what is the data that exists elsewhere? Yeah, do you want to answer that, Kate? Um, sure, I can try. Uh, I think I hear you saying that if we tax and regulate marijuana, more people will smoke marijuana. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just okay. asking about the data itself that must exist okay. not only in the United States, but in, in uh, neighboring countries where um, decriminalization has taken place. So that's what I'm asking about is that the data analysis has a social impact. Right, and I guess I'm asking what kind of data exactly? Data about use or data about? Data about use, okay. yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And whether, whether in, in terms of the, whether cannabis is a drug that uh, uh, one shouldn't be bothered about, you know, as opposed to, to heroin or crack or something like that. Well, this is a little f a field of the subject, I think, but just very quickly, um, there is data from Colorado that shows that um, basically marijuana use rates don't go up significantly at all after legalization. Also, we have passed decriminalization in Massachusetts, so it's already not a crime to possess under an ounce of marijuana for personal consumption. Um, and we haven't seen measurable increases in use since then. What we have seen, however, is a drastic decrease in the number of people who are arrested for marijuana possession in the state. Um, so clearly, as Paola's data shows, uh, the problem's not over. And unfortunately, the reality in Massachusetts, what Paola's map shows very clearly, I think, is that really only people of color are facing any kind of law enforcement interaction because of marijuana today in Massachusetts. So decrim had the effect of making it possible for me to smoke weed and not have to deal with the police, um, but not for my black and brown neighbors. So that's really the, the issue that this map 
brings to the fore. And, and so if you're uncomfortable with those racial disparities in marijuana, you should vote yes. That's my view. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yes, uh, thanks for your work. It's fantastic. Um, I have two comments. One, Black Lives Matter has looked at this issue, but they're not narrowing it to cannabis use only. Number two, uh, the racialized and gendered aspects of this are really troubling. Uh, people are not looking at what's happening to black women. Okay, they get criminalized at a, at a higher rate even compared to black men. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be helpful to take a look at that population, segment of the population as well. And finally, has anybody looked at environmental justice? There are environmental justice communities right here in Boston that no one has done anything about for decades. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about um, how do, so you're doing work, and I know you're doing good work, and you're reputable, and you're working with a very reputable organization, so the graphs and charts I see that you're producing, I can be personally trust as reliable. Um, I'm wondering if there's any, as we're getting into um, an era where we're using a lot more sort of visualization data, um, if there's any kind of ways to evaluate whether something is um, valid as opposed to propaganda, say, even yeah. if it looks valid. And I mean, we can just see like how people think, people can spin things in all sorts of ways and um, a lot of us might maybe can't necessarily look at the code and or, yeah. or anything. So I'm wondering, do you have any ideas or are there any organizations that uh, will evaluate sort of the data that's being put out in visualization form to tell you if it's hmm. is trustworthy? That's a great question and I don't know how to answer. And yeah, we are... Um, basically uh, appealing to our reputations, mm -hmm. you know? Like, yeah. So um, that's also why the code is there, but mm -hmm. I recognize that not all the people can mm -hmm. read the code. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, of course, in the Brisbane lit litigation, one of the arguments of the DAs was that it was not peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. Like the, mm -hmm. my affidavit was right. not peer reviewed. Uh -huh. And yeah, it, it is not, yeah. right? So, um, but that doesn't mean that the uh, oh, but to counteract that, mm -hmm. I, I think what I'm doing is not an analysis. Mm -hmm. I, right. Like, you know, I, I'm not right. trying to, I'm not using uh, AI or uh, deep learning or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying just to describe things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I try to keep it like, like that. It's like this table is brown and the computer is gray. Mm -hmm. And if you put them together, it's, uh, com you know, stuff like that. It's right. just description. Mm -hmm. That way, I, I, I think I can convey the message mm -hmm. very easily uh, without trying to uh, to like uh, involve more uh, more thinking or more confusion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. It's it's so complex. Yeah, but I think thanks for asking that. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. I'm not the same. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I wonder, it's clear that there's still a great deal of work, valuable work, to be done with this data set, and I look forward to hearing more, especially in light of next week's um, court proceedings. But I'm wondering if you've identified, like, what's the next big data set you're going to go to work on that might produce marvelous well, results? I'm sure there are many out there. Yeah. One of them, um, like, I, I develop tools to explore data. One of them is uh, like a soundboard, like a pie chart, uh, but uh, enable, like in, 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 how do you say? Like an expanded uh, pie chart, you know, like a soundboard, that's the name of it. And what I use it for, I can show you, is um, for instance with the payroll of uh, Boston's, um, Boston's, uh, City employees, yeah. Uh, oh wait, this table. Yeah. So we have. I already imported the data sets, and this is the payroll, and these are their columns. We have the name of the employee, the department, its ti uh, their title, and then we have all these uh, income categories and the zip code. So if we want to see divided by 
department, we can see that Boston Police Department and Boston Fire Department have a big chunk, chunk of the payroll, like oh, the employees. These are only counting them, counting employees. But if we, if you want to compare it to, yeah, in terms of money, let's say the oh, total. No, wait. I need to restart because okay. Um, so we have this, and then if we want to do total earnings, and we say sum, and it's money, then we do this, and now we have two. This is the total earnings, and this is the size of the department. So you can see that, uh, like, in proportion, BPD is getting more money. But if you want it divided by, I don't know, um, title, can get very complex, but it, it's a lot of data. <laughs> so <laughs> you start to explore this type of things. And now let's focus on, I don't know. Uh, well, oh. Can I just say, Pamela, that yeah. one of the cool things that we saw with this tool is that, for example, Boston police officers who work in, in West Roxbury get way more overtime than police in other parts of the city, which is so weird. It's like, what's going on in West Roxbury that all these cops have like huge, hugely greater percentage of overtime than police elsewhere. So that's the kind of you you know unique insight that these tools allow you to see that you wouldn't be able to see elsewhere. No, police uh, people who work there. Where did you get the data? This is open data. Uh, you have to go to each different municipality. Yeah, this is only for the city of Boston open data. Yeah, so now we have this, which is uh, Boston Police Department only, and then by title, which is police officer, and then by zip code. So this enables you to see the, the thing that Kate was saying, which is that in this, in this um, zip codes, like the police officers make significantly more money than in other zip codes. Yeah. And those are the neighborhoods where there's no marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about, I feel like someone who's really demonstrated the power of like, uh, like data and data visualization, and I, there's so many like open data sources right now, and there's so many like open source user-friendly visualization tools. Can you talk a little bit about like where you are getting your own data, and where people can go and find this data, or what people can go and like visualize data kind of on their own? Yeah. Um, how, what I mentioned before, like even before thinking about data, is the the mission. Like I, I consider this being a mission. Oh, sorry, a mission-driven data advocacy. So that that's how I see it. It's like we have a, a mission, which is prove that the uh, interact inter, the police interactions are racially biased. And how do you which data do you need? So you start to ask these questions through research. And in many times, you will find that there are government uh, uh, departments that have data, a lot of data. But, um, and this is one problem I faced in my, one, one of my previous jobs, which was uh, in Mexico City's government, that we had a lot of data, but there was no impact of that data because there was no translation uh, from that. I, I mean, first, they don't know. Um, they don't know who is going to use it. Uh, and second, they don't actually uh, do the outreach for people to use it. So it's, it's like a, I don't know, like a neg and chicken problem, I think. But if you put a mission on it, and you can start to make all these diagnoses of, oh, I need this data set, and, and then I need to ask this person for what this column means, and then I need to do that, but yeah, it's it's very specific and very mission specific things. Yeah, it's there's no explorer and there's no like, uh, it's complex. <laughs> so we'll yep. Yep. Uh, 
thanks so much for the talk. Um, I'm a journalist in South Africa, and a lot of my work is bringing sort of information, uh, complicated information to sort of communities. Um, I was wondering, what was your interaction like with journalists? Did you bring them on early? Did you work with them in that way? Or was it a case of it's finished and then handing it over? What was that sort of process like? Um, we, we haven't had that much interaction with journalists yet. Um, because, I mean, we, um, so it's, I love to, to have more, con more uh, contact with them, but it hasn't happened. And I really don't know the ways to do it. And uh, also the, the little contact we've, we've had is like, they, they won't publish the maps. They are only going to write about it. Right. You know, like especially here. That in, it's my understanding that, the understanding that uh, Boston's um, media is very specific in its, in its actions and how, how they handle cases. Do, do they feel that they want to have had control over the whole process to publish it? Like it's almost like they don't want to collaborate. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, it's also through that I'm working on a, an advocacy organization, right? So yeah. it's, it, it might be also that, that they want to replicate my findings, and they, but they need the skills to, to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's like a catch-22. But I love journalism, and I think law and journalists are the, the, like the, the key of our society. But, yeah. That's great. I think we'll probably leave it there. Join me in thanking Paula for this terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you.